Now programming from the Illinois Channel, an independent nonpartisan corporation formed to provide nonpartisan coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. For more information on the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org. Just ahead, Governor Rauner and Senate Minority Leader Christine Rodonio and House Minority Leader Jim Durkin hold a press conference and react to the legislature once again failing to pass a state budget. Then in about 20 minutes from now, Senate Majority Leader Cullerton reacts to the state once again failing to pass a budget. Following that, in about 30 minutes from now, Senate Democrats react to the so-called grand bargain budget failing to pass the House. Then in about 50 minutes, business leaders hold a press conference to discuss how regulations and the General Assembly are hurting job growth in Illinois. And finally, in about 1 hour and 35 minutes, school superintendents hold a rally calling on the state to pass a budget and pay back the $1.1 billion owed to school districts around the state. That's all just ahead, after a brief word from one of our advisory council members. Illinois Channel salutes our advisory council members, leaders in business, education, law, medicine, and other fields from across Illinois. Hi, I'm Linda Brookhart, Executive Director of the State University's Annuitants Association. Founded in 1971, the State University's Annuitants Association is the only advocacy organization focusing solely on pension and health care benefits for the participants and beneficiaries within the State University's retirement system. We advocate for both active workers as well as retirees. The number of individuals are well over 200,000. As an association, we work hard to keep our members informed of possible changes in the law that may impact their pensions, their health care, and their general well-being. There is no other association working to keep individuals informed on issues that matter. This is the one reason we're also proud to support the work of the Illinois Channel. Its focus is to keep all Illinoisans informed of the issues that affect them, whether in state government or of significant changes in the private sector. The yes. Illinois Channel's in-depth, unedited coverage of legislative events, policy discussions, interviews with lawmakers, university presidents, and business leaders keep you informed on the issues that affect your life and the future of Illinois. I'm Linda Brookhart with the State University's Annuitants Association. I watch the Illinois Channel, and I hope you do too. The Illinois Channel, it works for all of us. Next, from Springfield, Governor Rauner and Senate Minority Leader Christine Rodonio and House Minority Leader Jim Durkin hold a press conference and react to the legislature once again failing to pass a state budget. This runs about 20 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, we've seen a complete dereliction of duty by the majority in the General Assembly. Once again, a tragic failure to serve the people of Illinois, a tragic failure to pass a balanced budget along with critical structural changes to protect taxpayers and grow more jobs. Instead, the majority in the General Assembly passed phony bills trying to manage phony headlines rather than solving the real problems that are facing the people of Illinois. The people of Illinois deserve better than this. The people deserve much better than this. We've got to stop just sticking it to taxpayers in the state of Illinois. We need to grow more jobs, and we need to protect our taxpayers, especially our homeowners, especially our small business owners and job creators. We have the highest property taxes in America, and we should not even be talking about tax increases unless we pass a property tax freeze along with local control 
of whether taxes go up or down on our property tax owners. Local control with a freeze is critically important. We should do this, we must do it, and I call on the General Assembly to stay in Springfield, come back to Springfield. Let's pass a balanced budget with meaningful change to fix our broken system. Please, members of the General Assembly in the majority, do not travel around the state holding sham hearings about a balanced budget, sham hearings that if they were to be meaningful at all, could have and should have been held last winter when the budget discussions began for this fiscal year. Don't go through a process of just trying to create phony headlines around the state. Get here in Springfield, pass a truly balanced budget with structural changes to grow more jobs and protect our taxpayers, especially our property taxpayers. The people of Illinois deserve this. They need this. Let's get this done. With that, I'll turn it over to Leader Redonio from the Senate. Well, thank you. I am actually deeply disappointed to be standing here today under this circumstance where we don't have a budget and it's pretty evident that we are not going to have that budget. The message from Republicans has been clear from the very beginning that we need fundamental reforms to our state that affect um, the efficiencies, the tax burden that people um, have to endure, the um, changes that will make us more job friendly. In exchange for that, we would be able to perhaps find the revenue to create a truly balanced budget for the first time ever. We actually had some success early on in the Senate, and I think the governor has recognized that, and it was a great experience, which is what makes us doubly disappointing to be here at this point. We didn't get that over the finish line. Um, some of the reforms that we really needed to have, um, the Democrats were not able to come to agreement on in time to pass it across to the House. That said, it's crystal clear to me today that even if it had gotten the House, that Speaker Madigan has absolutely no intention whatsoever of changing a single solitary thing in this state. I mean, even the school bill, the school funding reform bill that was hijacked and turned into a massive bailout from Chicago since the time it left the Senate, um, the business reforms, um, higher uh, minimum wage, things that, that the business community spoke about just a few minutes ago are anti-job. The property tax relief that the speaker referred to is something that um, they passed very, very late in the session two years ago. It never made it to the House. There's no property tax reform coming from the House, none whatsoever. And that is the one thing that we hear about from our constituents constantly. And in order to get a handle on those taxes, we're going to have to change the way that we do things, and it's going to be hard because you can't easily reduce property taxes without fundamental changes. That's what we're talking about. That's what we need. Um, again, it's disappointing to be here at this late date without getting the important changes that we needed. Um, but I hope we can revisit the early success we had in the Senate, where I do believe we had some good faith negotiations and resurrect those in order to um, come in and get a budget and reforms before the beginning of the fiscal year. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Leader Durkin. Thank you. I speak as a Illinois resident, a father, a husband, a taxpayer, and also a member of the General Assembly. To say I'm disappointed is an understatement. I am bitterly disappointed in what has happened these past three years by the failure of the Democrats in the House and Senate, their failure to work with us and with the Republican governor to pass something called a balanced budget. Bitterly disappointed, as is my caucus. So instead of doing the work they were sent here to do, members of the majority party focus more on making phony, baseless headlines than real change. They refuse to do what is necessary to pass a budget that is balanced and block change that would move the needle on job creation while protecting taxpayers. We're witnessing bills up in the House right now in which they are stating, one in particular, workman's compensation reform. They stated in their opening argument, the sponsor, this is going to drive down cost for employers and help them grow their businesses. 
there are 12 business associations who are opposing the who are, who are opposing the bill, and actually it will do more harm to our large manufacturers and small businessmen than good. This is how they do. This is how they operate. They pass bills that they know will fail or they will not be signed by the governor and run around the state proclaiming that they are protecting the small guy, the businessman, or the middle class. I've heard a lot about the middle class lately. The speaker claims that I'm not going to do anything that is going to disturb the quality of life of the middle class. Well, before the Democrats in the House proclaim their protection of the middle class, they need to apologize to them first for what they've done to them for the past 20 years. Questions? You were going to let you reduce your profile the last couple of weeks, uh, not speaking on the floor, being on the floor, casting present votes, uh, as we come to this conclusion here. Well, anyone who's an observer of this institution knows the leaders are often not on the floor. Um, the present votes were primarily in response to those um, bills that where the reforms were incomplete. You know, as I said, we did have some, some success beginning to move forward. Where that ended is when we got responses, unfortunately, from the Democrats saying we can't go any further because the trial lawyers won't let us. We can't go any further because the unions won't let us. I never heard we can't go any further because the taxpayers won't let us. You know, we're here for the taxpayers of the state. I saw movement, and that's when I would cast a present vote, but it wasn't enough to create the fundamental change that we have to have in the state in order to stay competitive. And if anybody thinks we're not competitive, just look at the out-migration figures. It is the most frightening thing that we can possibly see. And it's not old people, it's millennials, it's families. They are leaving the state and they're leaving it for better jobs, for a less expensive cost of living. And unless we change things here, um, they will continue to leave. Money. Governor, can you talk about the lack of trust here? Speaker Madigan says that Democrats in his chamber simply don't trust you to negotiate good faith. They just point to the Senate talks where they say that you move the ball forward or you interfere and hold votes off of the deal. Um, I applaud the senators who I believe worked in good faith for months to get a balanced budget with changes to fix our system. And I applaud the senators, Democrats and Republicans who came together. They passed real procurement reform. Not the procurement reform that I recommended. It didn't go as far as I think we need to go on procurement reform. But as a compromise, I would sign that bill. It's a compromise. It's about halfway to what we should have gotten. It was a compromise. I support that. And I applaud the senators for doing that. Same thing on pension reform. The senators, Democrats and Republicans, came together and passed a real pension reform bill. I applaud them for that. It didn't go as far as I would prefer. It didn't go as far as I think taxpayers need, but it's a compromise. I would sign that bill. It would be part of a balanced budget and be a step in the right direction. As they got closer on other issues, term limits, um, per, uh, uh, consolidation, local government consolidation, very important. Workers comp, very important. And then the single biggest thing we need, true property tax relief that's lasting. Um, Speaker Madigan and the House Democrats sent a lot of special interest groups, a lot of lobbyists over, pressured the Senate Democrats very harshly, and killed the deal. They gave up at the end, and the, and the grand bargain failed. But what we can never do is give up. The people of Illinois demand change. We need to go in a better direction on jobs and taxes and schools, and we cannot let the House majority with their special interest groups dictate terms. We just need to stay strong, get a balanced budget with changes to fix our system. Governor, Governor, Governor. Governor. Yes, 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 sir. You traveled around the state, talked about the budget. Um, I expect you're going to be doing it again this summer. How is that less of a sham? How did you create less phony headlines than you accused the Democrats of doing, of going to get input from the public? When I go to communicate to uh, the people of Illinois the status of how broken our system is and what we need to do to get a balanced budget, that's an essential part of what I do. Hearings about a budget, hearings where taking public testimony about a budget, now 
Now, after the end of the General Assembly, that's not real hearings about getting a balanced budget. That is a sham. That is a sham to manage you to write up headlines and, and to get phony headlines. That's not real change. We should be negotiating the final terms. They know darn well where we are apart, what we need to do to cut, what we need to do to reform the system. The majority in the House knows darn well what's done, what needs to be done. They're not doing it. They're leaving Springfield and going to try to create phony headlines for you to report around the state. And that's, that's a dereliction of duty. This is a fundamental dereliction of duty by the majority in the General Assembly. I'll bet, I'll bet, may I have a follow-up, please, Governor? May I have a follow-up to that? Just a follow-up question. It's right on the same subject, Governor. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why do you think June 30th there might all of a sudden be some kind of compromise? Won't it be harder? They're looking for Republican votes on the tax. So all of a sudden by June 30th folks are going to agree? To me, we should have had a balanced budget two years ago. And we can never give up. We need truly balanced budgets in this state. And we need reforms to grow more jobs. And we need reforms to protect our property taxpayers. We can do this. Now, now, the majority that's controlled the spending in this state for decades, we didn't get to $180 billion in debt because they were doing their jobs properly. It's, they do not like to have balanced budgets, but we've got to live within our means. It's not fair to our children and grandchildren. We in Illinois have created deficit spending for so many years that we're leaving $180 billion of debt onto our children and grandchildren. That is immoral. We've got to stop doing this. And the only way we can pay down the debt and get a better future for our children and our grandchildren is to grow more jobs in the state the key to doing that is to get property tax relief. Property taxes are the number one tax pushing our employers out of the state and pushing our working families who can't afford to stay in their homes. We need true, lasting property tax relief, and we need reforms to be more competitive and grow more jobs. Last question. Yes. Last yes. question. Yes. The state constitution seems to say that if we don't balance the budget, we demand that the General Assembly majority be here in Springfield and negotiate a compromise, truly balanced budget with changes to fix our system. This is what we have to do. We can, and we can never give up. I work 24-7. The General Assembly needs to be here, not traveling around the state holding sham hearings, getting a truly balanced budget. We could have and should have done this two years ago. The people of Illinois expect it to be done. You can't find anyone in the state of Illinois that won't say, we need to get more jobs in this state, make our economy more competitive. You can't find anyone in the state of Illinois who won't say, we need property tax relief. Our property taxes are too darn high. Democrats feel it just as passionately as Republicans in this state. This is, this is about good government. These issues, these changes to our system are not partisan. They are about good government. They are about fixing our system for all the people of Illinois, irrespective of political party. But what we have here is insiders who've been in power for decades who created the current system and refused to change it. They and their cronies are making a lot of money from the current system. They don't want to change it. And we need the people of Illinois to understand what's at stake. We need to change our broken system. That means true, true, lasting property tax relief. And we need to protect our taxpayers. Our taxpayers should come first. They need to be protected. We need a balanced budget. And to, the key to doing that is growing our economy. Now, when I first became governor two years ago, I proposed $6 billion in cuts to get to a balanced budget, more than $6 billion in cuts. My recommendations were ignored by the majority in the General Assembly. 
and they just went on and passed a more than four and a half billion dollar out of balance budget that year that never went anywhere. And then last year, they didn't even pass any budget whatsoever. This is a dereliction of duty, the part of the majority in the General Assembly. We need to fight for our taxpayers, make sure they're protected, bring down our property tax burden, it's the highest in America, and most importantly, grow more jobs in the state of Illinois. That's the key to our future, a better life for our children and our grandchildren. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Next, from Springfield, Senate Majority Leader Cullerton reacts to the state once again failing to pass a budget. This runs about 10 minutes. Hi guys, we're still in session as you know, so I wanna get back up there. Um, I didn't wanna keep you too late. So, um, obviously I'm disappointed we don't have a budget. Um, it's very frustrating. Uh, we did work hard all session trying to do that. Um, people don't like uh, cuts programs, we don't like to pay taxes, but if we don't solve this impasse, both of those are going to get worse. You're going to have to have more cuts and higher taxes. But I would say this, if you went back to January 11th and we filed the bills, Senator Rodonio and I filed the bills for the grand bargain, and if, if we knew that day that on May 31st we would have been able to pass a budget after negotiating with Republicans and the governor that to the penny had a budget that spent exactly the amount of money that he wanted us to spend. And since he had called for tax increases to have a balanced budget, we picked his tax rate in order to, to balance it. In addition to that, we passed out of the Senate pension reform, uh, education funding reform, a property tax relief, workers comp reform, uh, consolidation of government procurement reform and the minimum wage and we we knew we had all of those things passed on May 31st you would have thought that we were would be celebrating tonight and yet we're not because the Republicans who we worked with who we drafted their bills together with us didn't vote for the bills and so that's the disappointment so obviously I'm uh, uh, ready to uh, continue to negotiate, to, to continue to work to try to pass a budget because we're gonna start to see some real pain now. We're gonna start to see downgrades. We don't have any funding for schools. We don't have any funding for higher ed and a bunch of social programs. We don't have a budget. So it's gonna have to come to a head. It should have come to a head tonight, but it didn't. So I'm willing to continue to work. I'll be happy to answer any questions so I can get back upstairs. Will the Senate be in continuous session with the House? We have the same uh, adjournment resolution that we're going to adopt tonight. Uh, I don't know if I'd use the word continuous. We're not gonna come in every day. We'll come in here when there's, uh, whenever the governor wants us to or whether there's something to, 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 uh, to vote on. Well, the governor would probably say, if he were here, that they weren't the bills he wanted, that uh, they're watered down, they're booby-tracked, they yeah. bail out for Chicago. Yeah. All those dog whistles. Yeah, those are dog whistles, that's right. In the meantime, if you read the bills, you know what's in them. The budget itself, it's a spending bill. It, it has a, the spending levels identical to what he asked for. In his budget, he had a hole in his budget and said to be filled in by the Senate grand bargain. And we filled it in with the tax rate that they told us they would uh, no, go no higher than. So, and then he wanted reforms. The pension bill had 15 Democrats and 16 Republicans. That's a classic way of compromising. It was everything he wanted. Everything he wanted. Uh, the uh, education funding bill that we just passed, he set up a commission. That, that commission couldn't come up with a bill. We drafted the bill. And instead of just honestly describing how much that benefits many, many poor areas of the state, many of which are represented by Republicans, they said they fall back on this age-old uh, gimmick of saying it's a bailout for Chicago when it's not. It's really uh, disappointing. The governor said uh, to his uh, staff on Sunday that uh, this bad deal would be vetoed. So isn't it better to not have the House pass a budget that the governor's going to veto and we wait a couple of weeks? 
I would have preferred I would have I would have preferred to pass a budget and put it on his desk, okay? After he, well, I'm not trying to blame him. I would I would hope that it was upon some reflection when the business community calls him while we hold the bill for 30 days and he gets downgraded that maybe he'd reconsider. Go back and ask him what it was that he wanted. Senator Rodonio introduced a two-year property tax freeze bill on January 11th. Why? Because that was the same that she introduced two years before that. What made it four years? And, and, and this is, these are the reforms that he asked for, that I agreed, even though I didn't like some of these things, I agreed to work on them, and we passed them. If you're saying we gave him everything that he wanted, why do you think that there's no budget? Ask him. Ask him. He, he hijacked the grand bargain. He came in in the middle of the process, told the Republicans to vote no, and didn't give the support, and therefore, as a result, the same thing happened over in the House. Republicans didn't vote for anything, and as a, with some exceptions. And as a result, we don't have a budget. Well, nor did the House Democrats. I mean, apparently, we only had about 46 votes. Well, that's the classic way of ideally passing a, uh, a bill. You have a structured roll call. That's what we started out with. That's what the pension bill was, 15 Democrats, 16 Republicans to get 30-plus votes. That's how you have to do it. But you can't ask the Democrats to do everything you asked for, and then, but we're not going to vote for it. And that's what we found. Uh, and I, I don't think there's, I think there's probably every Republican up there uh, knows that that's what happened. But they're, they're uh, from his party, and they have to listen to him, I guess. So, President, where do you go from here? <coughs> there talks with Speaker Madigan yeah. and trying to persuade the House to adopt either your budget or some form of it. Well, you know, we started off by working together with Senator Rodonio and myself to see if we could just work together, with not with the House, just with the Senate, to see if we can do it. Not with the governor, see if we can just do it. And again, it got hijacked. All we can do now is what our Senate caucus, Democratic Caucus did. We're the only ones that actually voted for and passed a balanced budget. And I come back to the fact, I, I want you to go and look at what the governor introduced back when it was budget time. I mean, a budget is spending, and if you need revenue, no more than what they say they would, can go for, and that's what we did. We got great ideas from the Republicans. That's how we were able to balance it. We got their cuts, $3 billion in cuts. We got it from sitting down with them and working on it. It's his budget. He can't criticize it. And, and yet he says, well, I don't have enough. I mean, are you serious that we have a balanced budget that he asked for. We have all these reforms, but we have a two-year property tax freeze instead of a four-year property tax freeze, and that's why we don't have a balanced budget? That's crazy. And so why don't we have a four-year a, a property tax freeze? Because many people didn't want to have it at all. It's kind of a, not the, a good policy when you have really poor school districts, and they're not all the same. But that's a one-size-fit-all fit solution. So uh, we compromised. Everything we talked about here, we compromised. Next, from Springfield, Senate Democrats react to the so-called grand bargain budget failing to pass the House. This runs about 20 minutes. Well, we can't always agree on where we're going to stand. <laughs> um, but what we can agree on is that what this state needs is a change and a change that we haven't seen in the past two and a half years, and that is creating a budget, a balanced budget, that is going to move the state forward. And we have heard from those in the bonding rating agencies, and uh, we have also heard from our constituents and doctors and other providers um, that said that the reason why we stick with you the reason why the bonding agencies do not downgrade us is because what they know, like we know in the Illinois Democratic Senate, that we can do better, that we have the capacity to make this state work for all of its individuals, to make sure that our, our universities are competitive, to make sure that our children from P to 12 are getting a quality education that prepares them not only for college, but for jobs so they can be, again, good citizens, good tax-paying citizens here in the state of Illinois. 
we know that we have not only the potential but the capacity to do that. And, and as a consequence of that, uh, we passed that a $37.3 billion budget, which ensures that our schools will start on time, which ensures, in fact, that industries will come to Illinois and, and be here because we're a competitive state. We have made concessions to, to individuals that, one, had some outrageous concessions, but we made the difference by addressing those and meeting with those individuals to come up with what we know makes Illinois works, and that's a negotiated ending. So today, I'm, uh, again, not only do I stand here with my friends, but I also have some other of our members uh, who will comment on some of the particulars that we've done to move our state forward. And I believe we have Senator Andy Menard. Senator Menard. Thank you, Senator Trotter. Um, Andy Menard from the 48th District. Um, uh, I'm going to pick up where uh, Senator Trotter left off. Uh, the Senate Democrats have acted responsibly over the past five months. If you recall, uh, the first action that we took in January was to pass a measure uh, to limit terms of leadership in the Senate. Uh, that was a first of its kind measure. Uh, we all took that vote and that was the first step uh, to where we have ended uh, this session today. We've passed major bills that the governor has both asked for and demanded in some cases. Procurement reform, workers' compensation reform, pension reform, local government consolidation, property tax relief as recently as yesterday, and of course education funding reform, which was the uh, topic of uh, the previous press conference and one that's probably coming right after us. Um, along with that, um, we have advanced a budget to the House uh, that lives within the governor's spending limits that he put forward on February 15th in his budget address. Um, he put forward a number of $37.3 billion as a measure of success. That was the governor's measure of success, and the Senate Democrats met his measure under his terms. We also cut $3 billion, which is not easy for us to do. We had many discussions, lively discussions in our caucus meetings about how to achieve both cuts and revenue and live within the governor's terms of spending. We achieved all of those things in our caucus. Those bills are pending today in the House of Representatives. So this session, uh, led by everyone here and members that uh, are not here who are on the floor right now, we have produced a result uh, that we are quite proud of as a caucus. And we believe this is the best way to move forward as a state and address all of the things that we know we have to address in order to end this impasse and move beyond this situation that we're in today, 700 days today without a budget. Um, this didn't just happen. Um, our appropriation committees, our uh, revenue committee, uh, we have worked week in and week out, as each of you know. Uh, we began by asking agency directors that have been appointed by Governor Rauner to help us in the exercise of cutting from the budget. Not just the budget that he presented, but the budget that we're living under today, those spending limits. Uh, if you remember, we did not receive one dollar of suggested cuts from the governor's agency directors, the people who are the experts on their agencies and what they spend their money on. That was an exercise that we went through in the Senate. Uh, then we went back and we asked the same agency directors to go through the governor's uh, spending numbers for FY18 and help us fill that gap, not just the larger issues we have to deal with, but that specific gap of $5.4 billion in the governor's introduced budget. Again, we were met with resistance from the agency directors. I recall Director Sheldon, who came before our committee and said he can't stand another dollar's worth of cuts the Department of Children and Family Services. That's what we heard. So despite all of these things along the way where the governor was uh, fighting us, where he was saying things to make us stop, you know, promoting ideas that just aren't accurate or even putting out half-truths, I would go as far as to say as lies about what we've done in the Senate. We acted responsibly. 
Those measures are pending today in the House of Representatives. Senator Staines. Thanks, Senator Menard and, and Leader Trotter. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to fill in a little bit more detail. Um, what you have over here uh, is just a visual, simple visual that shows the what we did versus what the governor's office had suggested we do back in February. When he introduced his budget, page 30 of his budget book, 37.3 billion in spending, as Senator um, Menar noted. We lived within that. He had an unbalanced budget, though. We have now filled that in to actually come up with a surplus, and we did that by actually implementing bills that help achieve reductions in spending, the pension reform bill, local government consolidation bill, procurement reform bill, and we made a lot of cuts to specific line items to help achieve spending reductions. And then we actually also passed a revenue bill that helps fill in the needed revenues to balance. We've all known all along we're going to have to deal with both sides of the ledger, revenues and uh, spending to actually come up with a balanced budget. Um, I today really urge the duelers here to put down their swords and come to the table and negotiate in good faith. Uh, we, the Senate, have done this. Um, we have done it with the support and help of Republicans in the Senate. Um, the Brady Group or Brady Bunch has met at least 15 times. Um, the budget that we passed is not a democratic value budget entirely, the way we would do it. It clearly reflects priorities in the way Republicans would want to go about developing a budget. That's why we lived within the governor's spending limits uh, that he had proposed, and that's why the revenue, as you're going to hear from Senator Hutchins in a moment, lives within the spending uh, and new revenues that they had negotiated with us at the table. We now need the governor and the House to join in and get a balanced budget. We have been doing the response thing in the Senate. I know it's easy to lump us all into the same group of ineffectual, we haven't gotten our jobs done. Well, we in the Senate did do our jobs. We stood up, we passed a balanced budget. Uh, we now need everyone to step up and do their jobs and do this for the state of Illinois. Uh, too many folks out there, I mean, this to me is heartbreaking. I've been trying to keep it together all day long uh, because I know when we don't do this, what happens out there across the state in terms of universities laying off, we've heard today, about two more universities doing huge layoffs, kids who are not going to be able to go to school next year because their universities can't possibly keep the MAP grants going for them, um, all the social service agencies that are laying off, domestic violence shelters have not gotten paid for a year. Um, story after story, we all know it. We need to do our jobs. Everyone needs to help the Senate fill in and be the responsible folks. So we're not alone being the responsible folks in the room. Thank you, and I want Senator Hutchinson to come up. Hi, everybody. Um, so <clears throat> I had the wonderful task of trying to negotiate the one thing nobody likes to talk about, but everyone treated like it was our big win. It was always proffered that, you know, if we do the reforms the governor wants, we'll give you the tax increase that the Democrats want. That in and of itself was not true. That's, that's not the win. The win is the stabilization of the state. And it's not like anybody takes a revenue vote lightly or easily especially not with the way people feel about taxes in and of themselves. It's one of the hardest things to do. So when we talked about what kind of a revenue package we would come together, and we also knew at the end of the day that we couldn't say we had passed a full, responsible, balanced budget without dealing with the revenue side of the equation. And we as a caucus stepped up and did that uh, as hard as it was. And part of the reason why that Senate, Senate Bill 9 didn't hit the board until May is because we worked from January through May to try to figure out where people stood, where we could get votes, how we could put, you know, cobble something together that did reflect the things that we all hold dear in this caucus. And even after that, after we uh, used the income tax rate that the Republicans demanded, after we used the number that they laid out, that the governor laid out in his own budget address after we spent months and months and months and untold amounts of hours actually sitting in rooms with people to have these hard conversations only to get a letter the very next day from their very own budget director saying that they didn't participate and they didn't have anything to do with this and this is all the Democrats. At the end of the day, we knew, and I said this in my closing, that we don't have very much more time, that this, that this is 
every time they would say, we need more time, we need more time, we need more time, we kept pointing to the fact that the clock was running out. They were just running down the clock. And what we know in our caucus is that it is much easier to stand up and demand and argue for things when everyone loves you. It is much harder to do it when you have to do it and everyone's not gonna love you. This is not the, this is not the easy part of governing, but this is the necessary part of governing. And we stand very firm and extremely proud of the fact that we did what we believe to be the right thing, which was pass a fully funded budget in all of its parts that addresses all of the areas that we've heard about for two years now. So it's one thing to yell and scream about taxes. It's another thing to argue about what those taxes pay for and to have all seven of our universities downgraded on one day to see 47,000 kids lose their child care, to have all of our social services running on threads, struggling to get by. We can go story after story after story, but what we end of the day what we know is that the cost of chaos is something you can't manage, and this is what this state is right now. We are all trying to manage chaos. Time's up. Well, I didn't hear the comments, but you just repeated them, I suppose. Uh, but that, I, I can't elaborate on that. Uh, we were elected by our constituents, the same people they were. Uh, we know that our constituents told us that uh, they wanted us to do our job, and our job is to have a balanced budget which allows for those things to enhance their quality of life to happen. Um, so I can't comment on why he's taking this let's wait posture when the work needs to be done today because we've already waited too long. Senator, uh, it seems to me as an outsider that you all have moved and probably made a number of compromises that at the beginning of this process a lot of you didn't think you would be making. That's right. <laughs> Have you talked yeah. to the governor <laughs> and, and at what point do you say don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good? I mean, this is Oh, oh, th oh, that's that's been said. I mean, every little parable, analogy uh, from, you know, the sky is falling. You can think of has happened. So those those comments have been made. Uh, Leader Harmon, look, there's a price to leadership. It is not a difficult thing, but we've done our job. It's time for the governor to do his job. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the governor to do his job, and all he does is campaign. It's time to govern. Sure. No, I don't. I, let me be clear. I didn't. Uh, he did. I didn't. I don't. It, it's not a feel like. It's. <laughs> he did it. Um, you know, even. Even as recently as today, the statement that came from the governor's office about uh, Representative Davis's amendment that's pending in the House is completely inaccurate. I don't know who wrote it, but they need to reread the bill, and they need to make a different decision about whether or not to put out accurate information or inaccurate information that I would say is deliberate to kill progress. So, you know, we could, we could talk about this one for, for a long time. We've been at this now for two years. This caucus has passed three bills to end the system in Illinois. Three bills. And, and it, it was tough to do that. It was tough. This caucus has led on the issue. Every step of the way, this session, the governor has repeatedly tried to deny progress on something that he claims is the most important thing to him, which is equity and public school funding. His actions and his words don't match. But so, like, in the meantime, over the past few months, you know, when we've been talking to him, he's been saying, the Senate, I believe they're working in good faith, they're making progress, things are going well, we're very close. Does that match the robocalls? Does that match the robocalls? 
So it's one thing. It, again, there was we heard lavish, we were lavished praise <laughs> during the budget address about how we wanted the Senate to keep working, and how all you know this please continue to do your work. So we continued to do our work. Every uh, it was literally every week we were met back in the district with all they want to do is raise your taxes. They don't want to run, they don't want to vote on any reforms. Didn't matter what reform we passed if it wasn't exactly the way he wanted it as if we don't have a negotiation process in the capital. If it wasn't exactly the way he wanted it then it was we did nothing. That all they want to do is raise your taxes. Nothing could have been further from the truth and that lasted the entire 5 months. If you remember this time th right now we're saying we're hearing we will not get a signature unless I get comprehensive uh, tax relief, the, or property tax relief. And <laughs> this time last year, it was fair maps and term limits. So at every, you know, at every turn, we, keep do, we hear something in the building, but then what we get at home and in our districts, which makes it incredibly difficult to do your job and, and respond to your constituencies, when the messages are always conflicting, and then we're chastised for not listening to campaign stuff, because that's different. People say things in the campaign all the time. But we're supposed to believe what we hear in the building. Well, I don't, I, what, which, which part are we, when, when you make a public statement, which one are we supposed to believe? The one thing we do know is that um, when you want, if, if, you, if the goal is to get a budget, if the goal really is to get a budget, we'd have one. You're watching the Illinois Channel. The Illinois Channel salutes our advisory council members, leaders in business, education, law, medicine, and other fields from across Illinois. Hi, I'm Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. Education has never been more challenging in Illinois than it is right now. With comprehensive education reform recently passed by lawmakers and our state's financing of education remaining under pressure. That's why the Illinois Principals Association acts to represent the needs of students and our members. We keep our principals up to date on changes in the law affecting education policy, and we advocate to keep our schools safe and to maintain a healthy environment conducive to learning. With all the changes happening in every field and with the ongoing financial problems facing Illinois, it's vital we all know about changes affecting our lives. That's why the Illinois Principals Association is proud to be a part of the Illinois Channel's advisory on education. Their coverage, whether that of key lawmakers discussing changes in education, an interview with the Illinois Budget Director on the state's finances, or the one-on-one -on -one interviews with those working in education, all help to keep citizens across the state connected to the real issues that impact the education of our children. I'm Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. I'm also proud to say I serve on the Illinois Channel's Advisory Council. The Illinois Channel, it works for all of us. Next from Springfield, business leaders hold a press conference to discuss how regulations and the General Assembly are hurting job growth in Illinois. This runs about 30 minutes. I have had the uh, privilege of watching a lot of last session days over my career in Illinois, uh, both in the days of state government and also with the IMA for nearly 25 years. Today ends what I think to be one of the most unfriendly business to business from an Illinois General Assembly that I've seen in all the years that I've worked here. My Democrat friends like to say that we are in a race to the bottom. Unfortunately, I am here to tell you that we are winning that race. And that means that Illinois businesses and Illinois families are losing. The high cost of business activities such as workers' compensation is one of the biggest issues that face my membership. And the activity that has gone on in that particular issue will not make it a better place for Illinois businesses to operate if the legislation that has been proposed gets through the General Assembly. We have not seen any kind of action on a balanced budget in trying to get Illinois back on a firm fiscal standing. We have not seen any work that has progressed in improving the workforce allowing for educational activities to retrain our workforce for the jobs of the future. Instead, we have seen inaction, continuing battles between the factions in this General Assembly, 
And Illinois businesses are really sick and tired of what they're seeing going on. I'm here with my business colleagues today, and we felt important in the last hours of the assembly as it moves toward the May 30, 31st deadline to highlight many of the activities that have gone on. And there is in the press release a litany of bills that have been either talked about, proposed, or passed that makes it clear that Illinois is sending a message to businesses not only here in Illinois, but across the nation, that this state is not interested in improving the business climate of this state. And unfortunately, we continue to see Illinois close one day at a time. I'd like to call upon my good friend Rob Carr, the Illinois Retail Merchants First, to look at some of the issues facing the retailers. Thank you, Greg. Rob Carr, Illinois Retail Merchants Association President. Um, as Greg noted, uh, it's, it's hard to get your mind around exactly what direction Illinois wants to go. As we look at the national headlines and, frankly, the state headlines in terms of the retail industry, most of you notice and uh, carry it in your papers, on your radio and TV broadcasts, uh, every week, stores closing, retail uh, of all types and sizes announcing um, that they are closing. The pr unfortunate effect for them is all they hear right now out of Springfield are, is the narrative, much like the actions they have seen out of the city of Chicago and Cook County, which is to reach into our pockets with both hands. People want people to be earn more. They want people to make more. They want to uh, add additional costly benefits. Uh, they want to dictate the way we can schedule and what we can price. And the problem is that they, the math that no one can answer is with all of these costs that are being piled on, both with mandates and with tax increases, either proposed or enacted, how they expect anyone to be able to afford anything, how they expect to be able to develop in neighborhoods that are currently underdeveloped, let alone sustain in, in business sectors um, that have am ample or uh, uh, thriving development. Um, so it is, it is a bleak narrative when you are in the retail sector, uh, you're operating on an extraordinarily small and narrow profit margin, and you're seeing that simply vanish uh, at the fiat of government action. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn over to uh, my friend Todd Meisch, president of the uh, Illinois Chamber of Commerce. Todd. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. You know, I'm Todd Meisch, Illinois Chamber of Commerce president and CEO. Uh, and I will tell you that the chamber has been consistent since really this, uh, this uh, whole deadlock uh, began in that we believe that the very first thing the General Assembly needs to do to get us out from under uh, this endless cycle of uh, uh, taxation, spending more taxation, is you've got to grow the economy. Uh, and part of that is, of course, to go ahead and have pro-business, pro-growth policies, and I'd like to talk about some of those. But the, also the counter of that is that you can't undo anything that uh, is positive by doing harm to employers, and that's unfortunately what we've seen this session. A number of issues, whether it be a massive tax increase, $5.4 billion coming out of the Senate, under consideration in the House, evidently, but on the other side, a workers' compensation reform bill that is supposedly uh, is supposed to help employers, but really is fake and phony workers' compensation reform. That's the kind of thing that gets employers not just, it just doesn't hurt the bottom line, it makes them mad. It makes them angry. It makes them want to invest in other places other than Illinois. For instance, House Bill 160 passed the House just today. Uh, there are some things in there that may be positive. So employers, or the people who voted for that bill, are going to want to talk about some of the things that were positive. But they're going to completely ignore the fact that on whole, in the net is definitely in favor of, of in opposition to employers and is going to increase their costs. So House Bill 160, again, the gap between what it's uh, advertised as and what it really is is a huge, huge problem. Another bill that's along those lines is House, uh, Senate Bill 5, 1502, the so-called Right to Know Act. Sounds great, but the real problem is that it impacts businesses from Facebook all the way down to a car dealer and increases their costs, increases their exposure to liability, and is a terrible piece of legislation. Again, the gap between what's advertised, what it really is, uh, is really uh, detrimental to employers and our reputation going forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael Reaver, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs with the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Michael Reaver, Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Um, <clears throat> Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce has a unique perspective, uh, especially on what's going on in Springfield today. Um, for the past two years, our members in the business community in Chicagoland have experienced well over $2 billion in direct and indirect taxes, fees, and property tax hikes. Um, there's a complete unawareness down here in Springfield of 
the inaction that's going on here and how it impacts our members in the business community in Chicagoland. Um, not only is there is there inaction related to a state budget which does not provide the stability and certainty that businesses need to thrive and grow, but the the problem with some of the some of our colleagues or some of the co uh, general assembly members is that a lot of them are targeting and attacking businesses with a lot of the legislation that we're talking about here today, but at the same time they want economic development and jobs for their constituents. And those are two pretty mutually exclusive ideas. Um, specifically one example, as Todd mentioned, was the so-called right to know and the geolocation bills. Uh, two bills designed basically to allow plaintiff's attorneys and trial, firm, trial lawyers to sue businesses outright um, with no regard or um, actual you know, investment in protecting people's privacy or consumer data. That was a huge concern for us. We've spent the last several months along with the coalition, including the Illinois Chamber and uh, my, my fellow colleagues here, fighting that legislation when we could be working towards growing the economy and doing good policy and legislation that will allow businesses uh, in Illinois and in Chicagoland to thrive. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark Grant, State Director of NFIB. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as he said, I'm the uh, State Director of NFIB. We're a small business organization. We represent over 11,000 small businesses here in Illinois. And it's kind of hard to uh, follow up all this because you can hear what's been going on over here. But let me just talk a little bit about what our members think. Uh, they aren't surprised by what's happening with the legislature and the annex that have been pulled over here. Uh, but they are very disappointed. They were hoping that this year there might be something a little bit different, something that might help small businesses grow and thrive. But that's not the case. Instead, we're getting a litany of all these bills that make it much more difficult for a small business to grow, to employ people, and to, and to, and to prosper. Um, they want legislators who are focused on uh, not scoring political points, but actually enacting good policies that benefit all of Illinoisans, working families, as well as small businesses. The list is very long about of the small business bills or the bills that have affected small business. And um, I just stand with my fellow business folks here in opposition to what's been happening. Thank you. Questions for the group? Sir, the um, 160 originally uh, we had some high hopes for. Uh, there were some bad things in there that we identified right away, but there was enough positive uh, items uh, that we said, you know what, we'd like to have a conversation with the sponsor, Representative Zalewski, and see if we can go ahead and turn this something in that's a net positive for employers. So along the, uh, the signs that we've got to say are positives, um, and I wrote down here real quick, uh, state tax is certainly good for the agriculture uh, community, our coal and aggregate uh, producers had some tax credits they wanted to get in there that are in there as well. Uh, the shipping sales tax, um, kind of a half measure that helps uh, retailers have been sued by law firms, very similar to the Right to Know Act we've got a problem with. So that are a few of the positive things. On the downside, though, is there's this Keep Illinois Business Act, which says that anybody who takes an economic development incentive but has to move jobs to other states for whatever reasons uh, has to give back all their incentives. Nobody's going to take those incentives if, because no one knows whether they can uh, move one employee out of state or not. That's a real killer. Uh, research and development tax credit, MPC, are not in there. Those are obvious things that need to be extended. They're not in there. A $5,000 tax on all corporations, really a gross receipts tax, uh, that's very problematic as well. So 160, you know, we know Representative Zalewski gets this stuff. Um, it's kind of really a political document, we think, uh, but unfortunately it sends a bad political s signal to the people that we want to create jobs in, in Illinois. About Senate Bill 81, you know, the minimum wage uh, hike. Uh, I'm doing that one now. You guys believe maybe minimum wage is too high how it already is? Like, I know you guys are opposed to raising it to $15 an hour. Can you just speak more to that? I think the, the opposition is simple. It, it proposes increasing the, the uh, second largest or the largest cost in the retail community of their line item, 81.8% in five years. I think if you break this down uh, to consumers, for example, what if their rent or their mortgage increased 81.8% over the next five years? Who could continue to afford their apartment or their home in the next five years? I dare say almost no one. 
uh, could be could be able to, would be able to do that. Um, we've addressed this uh, from the math doesn't work. It, it's it's surprising, but um, union contracts for starting grocery clerks in the city of Chicago started eight forty three last time I checked. Those are th those are negotiated contracts, over, subject to the laws of economics. Right, so uh, clearly that math doesn't work for them. They t they like to target large corporations and suggest, well, if you didn't pay the CEO uh, as much, so we practice zeroing out CEO money. If you practice out, if you zeroed out the CEO of McDonald's, a person gets an extra four dollars and sixteen cents a year. So clearly the math doesn't work for the market, and uh, I think when you break it down for the consumer, uh, it, it sheds new light on it. Can you talk about the budget situation, um, the Senate passed the budget last week, the governor has said that he won't sign that unless there's a property tax freeze. Do you all agree with that position? We have agreed that there have to be reforms. If you're going to ask the people of Illinois to spend, uh, ask them to increase the taxes, which are necessary to balance the budget, there has to be uh, reforms that go along with that. I think the governor's been very reasonable in his request. The property tax freeze folks in Cook County are getting their assessments right now. Uh, Heard from a member this morning, 31% on their home that uh, the assessment went up, expecting uh, the increase to be similar on his business. So if you're going to be asking for increased corporate and personal taxes, looking at the personal, the, the uh, taxes on the uh, property is something that is really necessary. He also asked for workers' compensation reform. A lot of discussions went on in the Senate about that. We were very close to having uh, not everything that we wanted, but over years, and those who have watched uh, work comp reforms over the years, you don't always get everything that you would like, but it would have been an incremental improvement taken off the table at the last minute. House passes a um, uh, bill, or the Senate passes with a state insurance fund and some, as Todd said, fake workers' comp reform in it that will not move the ball forward. So those are items that if you're going to ask on the one hand for the citizens of Illinois to pay more, there should be a change in the direction and trajectory of this state. And unfortunately, the Democratic-controlled General Assembly has not agreed to that. Do you, as a collective group, agree with, however, the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club that, yes, reforms are great long-term, they talk about property taxes, they talk about workers' compensation, but guys all want certainty, you want stability, it's been two years, now we're working street without any sort of budget. Isn't that more destabilizing than workers' compensation or anything else? Well, should uh, the Democrats also, should there be a spirit of compromise moving to the middle? Democrats have refused to go against their patrons in the trial bar and organize labor on reforms for workers' compensation, as an example. Is it too much for them to try to meet in the middle? Uh, the Civic Committee's report points out what is the obvious to a lot of people. But the reality of it is, unless you make changes in making Illinois a more uh, attractive place to do business, you're not going to change the direct trajectory, as I say, and you'll have just this continuation of the same thing that we've had over and over. Be happy anybody else wants to speak to it. I think I think one other quick component is is it, you know it budget really does bring stability and certainty. But as we've continued to advocate to policymakers throughout, we need restraint. You're not going to get stability in Illinois if there's no restraint. And one of the biggest, most significant, in our opinion, when you talk about the main street, on re, a main. Uh, retailers on Main Street is the restraint that needs to come to local government, particularly as we look towards the city of Chicago and, and uh, their actions. Um, they stand to benefit significantly from any budgetary action that takes place in Springfield. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect them to start to have some, uh, to live within their means and to stop piling and reaching into uh, employers' pockets with both hands, as has been their practice to date. Without that restraint, uh, we're just back at this game again in a few years. Said when you voice for opposition to things like House Bill 160, their workers' compensation reform, that they argue on the floor, this is supposed to help business, this is good for business, and yet you're all here. Is this Democrats for show? Is it staff ears? Is it the state? So let's use one. Of, let's let's use one of their examples, the state fund that they they want to blame the insurance industry. And actually, all of us, we may have insurance company members, but we're not here to represent that particular industry. Uh, we have competition in the insurance arena. We believe in workers' compensation, so they pass a state fund that's going to take anywhere estimates of. Fifty, hundred, two hundred million dollars to capitalize a state fund to be able to compete in the marketplace where there are already three hundred companies writing workers' compensation in this state. Do we think that's a real reform that is going to offer a downward pressure on price on workers' comp 
cost in the state? No. So when they want to talk about that reform, it's really a, an obfuscation. It's a misdirection of what the real problem is in our work comp cost. And they do really don't want to work on changing that because you have tremendous opposition from the trial bar, organized labor, medical community on all of the things that go into workers' compensation. And frankly, a general assembly without strong leadership internally will not take on those challenges. Can you address, uh, and Kevin may have started off the already, but um, they extended, uh, at least the House bill, to uh, extend the edge credit, but uh, they didn't include research and development, they didn't include uh, manufacturing purchasing credit. Right. Todd talked to that. Yeah, we did talk to 160, and, and there are real problems mm -hmm. with it. There are a few things in there that are, are okay. Uh, and that's, I'm sure, what the Democrats will go ahead and play up. The problem is they're not going to talk about the things that are really detrimental to the business community and obvious things that should happen that have not. Research and development, MPC, probably at the top of that list. Graphic arts could be in there as well. Uh, but $5,000 new gross receipts tax to all sorts of corporations. Uh, some of the other things that are in there, it definitely is a net negative for employers. Um, and uh, unfortunately, again, just another kind of boondoggle, I think, to check a box, check a political box that says we did something on tax reform when in reality it made things worse on whole. And Greg, can you uh, address the research and development credit? Right? Why is that so important? To well, look at, uh, look at the companies we have in this state. The major companies are lifeblood, is R&D, to be able to be planning for the future. And we are now going on, what, year three without it, uh, that tax credit. We have a pharmaceutical industry in uh, this state that, on average, pays over $100,000 per job. Shouldn't we be encouraging that particular part of our uh, economic sector to grow? This is a discouraging uh, point to them and not having that kind of uh, tax credit. So it's sort of mind-boggling that a General Assembly wouldn't understand that. That And whether it's Republican or Democrat, just, these are about good middle-class jobs. We talk about all the time the disappearing middle-class in Illinois in this country. And one of the reasons that's occurring is the fact that good middle-class jobs, whether they be in the retail sector, service sector, or manufacturing sector, we're not growing in this state. We've lost 100,000 net jobs since 2000 across all sectors in Illinois, while we've grown 400,000 in population. So the things that the trend is wrong in being able to increase the number of jobs that people want to stay here. And you all hear it yourselves. People are looking for opportunities to go elsewhere and not stay in this state. Great. Dan Elders. Given that we had this weak economy for so long and the job loss you mentioned, what accounts for basically you guys losing the political fight when you walk the halls and talk to the lawmakers? Why are you not getting more cooperation? It would seem in this environment people would finally say we got to do something for the business. It would seem so, wouldn't it? it would, you would think that it would not be this hard. The numbers show it. And as Chicago has lost more population than any other major city in the country, this state's growth has been stagnant as, as states around us. You've heard me talk, Terry, time and time again, just about the manufacturing sector that Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, all have increased since the recession of 2009. Uh, significant numbers in their manufacturing sector. Illinois, totally flat. So somebody's got to wake up one of these days and say, what are we doing wrong here? And I think Rob hit upon it. You've got uh, local governments that continue to put pressure on uh, uh, their taxpayers locally, statewide. The unfortunate part of this fight that we have seen for the last two and a half years in this state is the fact that we cannot come together over a common sense approach to improving this economy. Bruce Rauner may have asked for things that he could never have accomplished with the political reality of the third floor in this building, but I would say that portions of the third floor in the Democratic Party haven't moved to try to compromise with him in moving forward on some of the business reforms and other economic reforms necessary. Do you think that politics or the political climate might have anything to do with that? Because of the fact that the campaign never ended. There was never a period of time in this building where people were just governing. It's been a continuous campaign. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be snippy about that, but yes, politics, and I said today earlier when asked, I believe that the politics of 18 have already invaded into the legislative actions of 17. You're already seeing that. I think that the actions that are being played out on both sides already that are playing out what the 18 race is going to be about makes it more difficult to solve these problems.
that to the principals on both sides and urge them? Well, we really haven't been asked our, my opinion of that. I don't know if the others have had those conversations. So, given that, I mean, next spring is going to be even more difficult. Um, what do you have a game plan for the summer and spring to keep businesses in Illinois? You know, if there's no legislative solution. Well, I, th I, th I think all of us here represent various sectors of the business community. All of us are on the road talking to our members, to news media outlets. I made 25 speeches this spring about the manufacturing situation in this state. The theme of it, Illinois is closing one day at a time. The fact that we're not keeping up with manufacturing jobs at our neighboring states. These gentlemen make the same kind of statements about other kind of industries. We've just got to keep uh, really shouting from the rooftops that there has got to be a change here. And frankly, you don't see the, the legislators, I, I guess, have the kind of feeling that, well, we better do this now, or what will we do next year? There just doesn't seem to be the sense of urgency, and that's very disappointing. I'll comment. And we'll be, we'll be embarking on similar tours throughout uh, the summer uh, to educate lawmakers, and I think to reach out to non-traditional allies as well. I, one of the themes that we have come upon the last couple months is reaching out to local governments. Mayors have got to become more, and frankly, city councils have had, got to become more willing to engage in this debate because for the retail sector, anyway, we are the, typically their largest revenue generator. And, and without us, uh, without a healthy Main Street, they're going to have a really hard time to deliver the services they think they want to deliver to their, to their citizens. What, what are you hearing from your colleagues from associations in the States. What's what's their viewpoint in Illinois? Are they, are you guys on the back saying, "Hey, keep you know, because they're getting more businesses." What's what's that conversation like? Do you guys have those thoughts? Well. Yeah, I do, and I'm sure the, everybody here does. I mean, they can't believe it. They scratch their head. Is it really that bad? I mean, you see quotes, the quotes that, you know, we don't want to be Illinois. I mean, we are the laughing stock of the nation. No budget. Largest unfunded pension debt of any state in the country. The idea that we've not been able to move forward on economic reforms. No. I mean, when I started in this business, if you would have told me 20 years ago that the state of Indiana would be putting up billboards encouraging people to come to Indiana, you'd have laughed at it. I mean, really, Indiana? But that's what's happening. I have a board chairman who needs to expand his steel operation in Bedford Park. He is looking at increased property taxes. He look at the fact that the pension debt in this state continues to spiral out of control. The idea for him, and he's got five facilities around the country, for him to pick Illinois, the Bedford Park facility, as the one to expand is most likely not going to occur. And he is a participant and active in the civic business of associations and doing things. So what do you think corporate leadership who might be sitting in Germany, New Jersey, Texas thinks when they look at Illinois and they make a decision, are we going to go to that state? I mean, it, it's the answer is uh, easy to make for those. Uh, you, you said uh, you brought up a story about a company that was listening in Houston and Chicago with their offices, and they chose Chicago because their uh, employees like the parks, the museums, the schools, the public transportation, the services, and that's why they decided to move there. And it was not over workers' compensation. It was not over these business reforms. So. You know, just going another two years or however long it is until there's no budget, you know, isn't that a problem with wooing business to the state? Yeah, it's, it is a hurdle. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and again, I can't speak for any one company, but did share in general terms. Actually, Michael may want to take this one as well. Because let's face it, there are some companies that have been moving to Chicago in particular for their corporate headquarters. And that's great. We're very happy to have them. But we believe that's very much in, despite, in spite of our problems. And I think that the curve is just getting steeper and steeper and steeper the longer this problem goes on. And what you really get with this inaction, going back to an earlier discussion about where the Democrats uh, you know, can they come in the middle? Their refusal to move at all sends a very, very strong signal to the rest of the business community that without uh, Governor Rauner here, we'd be likely to be passing a lot of these things that I think the governor is going to go ahead and veto. They could become the law of the land in two years, and that is going to, the fact that they're unwilling to act now on any kind of compromise, I believe sends a strong signal that they believe post uh, 2018 that we're going to only accelerate the downward path and that's going to be a real problem. But I don't know if Michael wants to talk particularly about Chicago. 
Yeah, to your question, um, I think first off, it's worth noting that one size doesn't fit all. So for whatever reason one business comes to Chicago, there's completely different reasons why another or others may come to Chicago. In addition, that's not, especially in our conversations with aldermen, Cook County commissioners, that's not necessarily the type of economic development that they're looking for. So when we're shooting ourselves in the foot, for example, with the right to know, so-called right to know or the geolocation bills, we're attacking and going after one of the strongest and most thriving and growing industries in Chicago, the tech industry, right? I mean, it impacted all businesses, but specifically it was going after tech. So when we're, when we're having the inaction that we have in Springfield, and then the inaction is possibly going to impact what Chicago does later to fill the budget gap at CPS or, you know, some of the fiscal challenges that they have because of inaction down here, that's also a huge concern for our members and in Chicagoland because, take for example, all the corporate headquarters have come to Chicago, right? So... The inaction down here in Springfield, that may force Chicago to relook at a head tax that was just dissolved, you know, four or five years ago um, by, by Mayor Emanuel. So there's a lot of, I think there's an incomplete conversation that's going on here in Springfield. And part of our job, Chicagoland Chamber, is to remind these legislators across Illinois what we've already done in Chicago. And again, $2 billion in indirect taxes and fees, if we're talking about filling a budget gap, with, for example, just for argument's sake, sweet and beverage tax, well, Cook County already passed that. And so now you're going to double down on a, on a horrible tax that's unnecessary, that kills a lot of union jobs. Um, that's a problem, and that's the picture and incomplete conversation that we're having down here in Springfield. And that's a concern because the inaction and then whatever may come out, to Todd's point, um, that are being passed right now is going to have an impact on our members, and that cumulative impact is incredibly negative. And it only depresses especially the areas that need the economic development the most. Okay, folks, anything else? Thank you all. What, One more. What's the message that you're putting out to your members? I mean, we, we hear all the bad bills that are going forward, and if the governor's not there, then they would become law, and they would veto, and so on and so forth. But what's the, the, the message you are trying to give to your members, especially after you, the, 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 the message is this was a very unfriendly General Assembly to business. It's got to change, or we're going to continue to see the downward spiral. We don't have to convince our members of that story general population needs to hear that story. Okay, thanks, Thank folks. Thank well, you. Next, from the state capitol, we speak with Tanya Dawood of the Illinois Retail Merchants Association about pending legislation, including the proposal to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and the so-called Right to Know Act, which would inform individuals of the information that is being gathered when they visit a website. We are here at the Capitol as the uh, ostensibly, at least the official version of the legislative session is winding down. There's a number of issues aside from the budget that uh, I think people m may want to be aware of. One, uh, which I think people have an easy time understanding, is the minimum wage. Yes. And as we uh, just take this, the House debated an increase in the minimum wage, minimum wage and passed it out of the House. Yes. Uh, what is the perspective of the Retail Merchants Association on that bill? Yeah, so we have long been opposed to the many variations of the uh, increase in the minimum wage. Frankly, to put it very short and sweet, you know, this is an increase in labor costs without um, some corresponding increase in revenue for the business. And so it sets sort of an artificial floor, if you will, and the business owner is going to have to figure out uh, either how to increase revenue in correspondence with um, this floor that's been set by the legislature, um, or, you know, they're going to have to make some very tough cuts. Now, for those who haven't followed the bill, what are the incremental increases over what period of time? Right, and so it's basically a five-year increase to get to $15, and so it basically starts at $9 in 2018 and goes to 15 in 2022. And the minimum wage currently in Illinois is what? It's 825, so it's a dollar above the federal minimum wage. So they're gonna, it would go up to uh, by basically around seven dollars more per hour over by 25 years. Five over years. Five years span. Uh, for every dollar, if people work full time, that's two thousand hours a year. So for every dollar an hour, that's an additional two thousand dollars a year. So we're talking about raising it by almost seven dollars over a five-year period so every worker would cost a business an additional fourteen thousand dollars a year in 
in just the labor, not to mention the so other costs, uh, higher Social Security matching costs and all. Have you put a dollar figure on how much this would take out of the retail merchants around the state? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to um, quantify because each, each retailer is very different. But what I will say is that the city of Chicago has um, its own law to increase the wage to eventually to $13. And it's been doing so for the last couple of years. And we have spoken to business owners there. They actually came as a part of a task force that Mayor Emanuel put together to, find, to discuss paid sick leave, adding paid sick leave on top of it. And what the business owners told us is that the first thing they tried to do was increase prices. But there's only so much that you can increase prices. And then um, after they did that, they said, well, we'll have to cut employee hours. And so that's what happened. So basically what happened, at least in the city of Chicago, and I think it will inform what will happen across the state, is those employees that are working at or near the minimum wage now will see their hours cut so that there actually isn't a net gain for the employee. They're making more per hour, but they're working less hours. And that's not a result I think that the advocates want, but when you look at the economics of raising labor costs, in retail it's about 20%, restaurants is about 30%, um, you know, that money has to come from somewhere. And so we've seen employers make some pretty hard decisions in the city of Chicago, and I think that we will see very similar action taken across the state. The, uh, those who favor the increase would say uh, it's not right that people should be working full time and be basically living at a poverty level. What would you say to that argument? So, I, you know, when we're talking about uh, jobs that are either at or near the minimum wage, we're often talking about sort of low skilled uh, jobs. Um, little, and so the folks who are working in those jobs generally are first time entrants into uh, the market or there. Um, for a very short period of time. That's what the jobs are sort of engineered for. They're not engineered for um, someone who is raising a family, paying a mortgage, that kind of thing. These are, these are places where you start, but hopefully they're not places where you stay. And so um, to that extent, to the extent that someone is raising a family and paying a mortgage um, on minimum wage, you know, we think that that um, is regret regrettable. But again, if they are in that job, um, the point of it is to either grow within the company or move on, right? And so it's, it's, it's a place to allow folks who are new entrants in the market to gain a skill set that they can then take um, to the next place or hire within the company to make a higher wage and eventually be able to make that wage that does allow a person um, who's working full time to, to do the things that all Americans want to do, which is have families and, and be able to support themselves. And so I don't want to confuse the issue. You know what I mean? The, um, when we're talking about minimum wage, we're talking about very specific segment of jobs. Um, and those jobs uh, are not uh, the kinds of jobs that people should be working if they want to, um, to raise children and, and, and support, support a family. Before we move on, one last question on minimum wage. Uh, has Irma or other business organizations, I presume you might talk to other people in the business community about this issue, as they would also be impacted, um, discussed any kind of a compromise position where you might say, look, if you're a head of household, that's one thing, but we don't need to be going to $15 an hour for kids just going through high school or looking to make enough money to take a... a, a uh, go on a date on Friday night? Well, the, oh, the studies show overwhelmingly that most people who are working at or near the minimum wage are not actually supporting families. They are adding to um, the uh, uh, household income, but they are not the ones that are providing in total for the household income. So I want to make sure that we get that on the record. Um, and I think that we don't want to complicate minimum wage law. You know what I mean? We should set a wage and leave it there. Um, and then, you know, temporarily, um, should the occasion arise to, to raise it, you do. But frankly, we think that wages ought to be set on a federal level like they are in all of the other countries that have such sort of base wages. Um, because it should be a standard for where the company, uh, I'm sorry, the country operates. And so to have varying wages, whether it be at the state level or at the local level, um, we think that, that frankly, the policy should be set nationally, and that goes for sick leave as well. And again, 
all of the other countries that have sick leave policies, it's set nationally. Let's turn to another issue that the Illinois Channel has already focused on somewhat, and that is the idea that should people who go to a website be informed of the information that is being gathered uh, about them when they visit any website? Uh, I think a lot of people would automatically say yes, but they don't necessarily know the back end of the implications. And I should also say that uh, over the Memorial Day weekend, uh, as we're taping this, we're just back from that weekend, but the, uh, th that bill died in the House over the weekend. But I think there's some discussion that it could be coming back as an amendment, so we wanted to pursue it with you. What's wrong with um, uh, having a bill that says the, the right to know when you go to a, a website what information is being gathered about you as an individual that would then be gathered and resold to other third parties? Right. So, so the issue here is that we have we offered a compromise. The state of California has sort of a similar bill. It's called California Shine the Light Law, and that uh, requires companies to respond to customer inquiries about what information has been shared and or sold to third parties um, for direct marketing purposes because that's the thing that people are sort of most concerned about. You know, you're selling my information to someone who wants to market something to me and I want to know who you've done that with. And so, um, but this bill goes much farther, it's much broader than that. And they haven't given us a reason why it needs to be expanded. And so um, we said, listen, if you do California shine the light law, at the very least, Illinois has done something, something critical that it doesn't have today. But they sort of want, they shot for the moon and the stars. And when, you know, even taking shine the light in California, that requires a business to sort of build out a software back end because um, you have to figure out what information is being shared and respond inquiry by inquiry, right? And that's a lot of time, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of investment that should be spent on protecting the information that we are already collecting. That's, that's what really protecting the consumer is about, is making sure that whatever we have, we are protecting so that it's not breached. And it's a very difficult thing to do um, because there's people out there every day look, working very hard to breach the information that we're collecting. And well, and, and isn't the, the impact would be what the cost would be of those who run websites at a small end Absolutely. to comply with the wall? So there's a there's a question of the cost of compliance. Is yes, that not? there's a question of the cost of compliance and and the need, honestly, because for um, for what's being happened, consumers are fairly savvy. They know that information is sort of being shared. Frankly, this is sort of a, a new way of doing what we've always been doing. Um, so. Right now we're talking about the Internet of Things, but prior to that, we were sharing information all the time, and that's why you get some of the circulars that you get, and that's why you get uh, some of the magazines that you get, and, and, and all that promotional material. So this kind of, of uh, work has been going on for a long time. It's just now um, being brought into the Internet of Things space. And I think what it is about that is, is sometimes consumers don't understand the, uh, how the Internet of Things works, and so it, make, it gives them a level of uncomfortability. But what we're saying is it's very important to us to make sure that the information that we have is kept safe and the information that we share with third parties, whether it's we're marketing to you or not, is kept safe as well. And there's already law on the books to make sure that we're doing that. And in the event that we don't do that, um, that same law will require us to do a number of things to make sure that the, the consumer can go out and further protect their information. So, you know, Illinois has been very serious, and, and our organization worked very hard with the Illinois Attorney General's office a couple of years ago um, to get the language of that, of that law where it needs to be. So we've been very proactive in making sure that laws that are really about protecting consumers um, are out there and are working. This is not really about protecting consumers. And so they confuse, and I think intentionally, personal information with information that is personally identifiable. And there's a very distinct but important difference there. So this would require us to, to share um, information that we've probably shared with a third party in the aggregate, meaning there's no way that a third party can trace the information that we've given to a, an individual. So we may give 
ages. We may give sort of dates of birth, that kind of thing, but not actually give the person to whom the date of birth corresponds to. I'll, I'll share that the Illinois Channel. I can see on YouTube yeah. when people come and visit our videos uh, what gender they are right. uh, and what country they're from, right. but I have no idea who they are individually. Exactly, but this, this bill would require us to figure out who that information belongs to and then um, share that with that person. When the information is out there but it's not identifiable to that person. So it's requiring us to do a lot of work um, for not a lot of benefit to the ultimate consumer. And so we're saying, why don't we focus in on those things that will allow us to make sure that the consumer has some actual protection and not something that looks like pr protection but really isn't. I know you got to go to another meeting, so we'll <laughs> thank you for joining us, and uh, maybe we can follow up another time. For sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Montgomery, President of the Illinois Federation of Teachers. More than 100,000 IFT members work each day in schools, universities, colleges, and state agencies across Illinois. They're professionals who teach our students, keep our public buildings safe and clean and provide critical state services and much more. As an advocate for our members, their professions, and those we serve, the IFT works in Springfield to support legislative policies that promote high quality schools and public services. We also fight to protect collective bargaining rights for all our members and all working men and women. We do this through an organized program of advocacy, and year-round monitoring of public policy proposals. And that's why the IFT is proud to support the work of the Illinois Channel, whose coverage connects us to legislative debates and committee hearings, as well as interviews with leaders on key issues like the state budget, tax policy, public pensions, and education funding. Funding education is one of the primary responsibilities of Illinois state government. So we should all pay attention to the policies being proposed and how they may help or harm our children's futures. You know, what's happening in the State House today directly impacts what happens in classrooms tomorrow. And what happens in classrooms impacts the future of our state and our nation for decades to come. I'm Dan Montgomery, President of the Illinois Federation of Teachers. And I'm proud to serve on the Illinois Channel's Education Advisory Board. The Illinois Channel, it keeps us all connected. Next, from Springfield, school superintendents hold a rally calling on the state to pass a budget and pay back the $1.1 billion owed to school districts around the state. This runs about 30 minutes. Good morning. My name is Tony Sanders. I'm the CEO of School District U46 in the area of Elgin, Bartlett, and Streamwood, Illinois. Uh, this is the second largest school district in the state serving 40,000 students. And a few months ago, or less, a little over a month ago, I, along with some colleagues, uh, Dr. Jennifer Garrison from Sandoval, Dr. Jeff Craig from West Aurora, and Dr. Uh, Karen Sullivan from Indian Prairie, got together and had a conversation about the lack of movement on a state budget in Springfield, the lack of movement on uh, an improvement to the school funding formula, and complaints about the fact that the state is not paying school districts what it currently owes all school districts across the state. We came up with the idea of forming a grassroots organization just called Pass Illinois Budget. We are not affiliated with any statewide organizations. We are not funded by any organizations. We just started emailing superintendents from across the state, asking them to join us in a movement with three key messages. The first message to our legislators and the governor is to pass a budget, not a stopgap budget, but a full budget. Our second message was to improve the school funding formula so that it benefits all students across the state of Illinois. And our third message is to pay school districts what you owe us this school year. As of, as of today, the state owes school districts $1.1 billion across this state, which is unconscionable. Uh, joining me today behind me are uh, about 50 superintendents of the Pass Illinois Budget Campaign, which now totals 440 superintendents in total, 
representing 1.4 million school children, which is 69% of students in Illinois. With that, you'll hear some stories today from my colleagues from across the state. Good morning. Um, I'm Karen Sullivan. I am superintendent at the Indian Prairie District 204. We serve 28,500 students in uh, the suburbs of Naperville, Aurora, Bolingbrook, and Plainfield. We believe we provide an excellent education for our students in our district, but that is certainly being threatened by cuts in state funding to our district. So I know that when many of you here at Naperville, um, in my um, coverage area, you immediately think that uh, we are significantly well off. Well, Indian Prairie is not. I characterize us as a middle class school district. 20% of our students um, are low income. We have over 100 languages um, in our school district. We spend significantly less than the state average. Um, and we have, we have had to make significant budget cuts due to less state funding over the last several years to the tune of $40 million. Um, we've been very fiscally responsible with our taxpayers who shoulder a pretty significant tax burden for their schools. Um, but as part of all those budget cuts, um, we are a district with um, significantly high class sizes and less administrators than other districts in the state. Our community is one that believes in a balanced budget where your revenues match your expenditures. Um, we can't make that promise to our local taxpayers because the state doesn't meet their obligations to pay their schools. Indian Prairie will end this school year um, with the state owing us $15.3 million in categorical payments. That's the equivalent to us of a 44% general state aid proration. We can't keep operating at the same level with fewer dollars from year to year. The next round of cuts will significantly directly impact our students. We implore that our elected officials just do their job. We need a full state budget, one in which revenues actually match expenditures. We need a new school funding formula that will more adequately and equitably fund our schools and we need the state of Illinois to meet their financial obligations. Most importantly, we need the state of Illinois to meet their moral obligations to our future, which is our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. My name is Jeff Craig, and I'm the superintendent for West Aurora School District 129. We represent approximately 13,000 students in the western suburbs. Uh, we represent uh, students from five municipalities. We are a district of uh, about 67% low income. Um, our students in our district uh, buildings speak about 54 different languages. And we too have um, really tried to tighten our belt over the past two years. We have cut our budget $6 million. And with the advent of, of no category, minus three categorical payments for this school year, we are down $10.5 million of what the state owes us for expenses and services we've already committed and we've already expended. If this continues forward, we will have to make more dire cuts. As we said um, previous, right now our philosophy, and I think I can speak for all of those uh, women and ladies, our women and men behind us, is that any of our efforts to find a balanced budget, we take any measure that stays as far away from students and programs as possible. That may not be possible moving forward. If we have to begin cutting extracurriculars, if we have to begin cutting electives, and once our fund balances run out, of which we have about 25 days right now, which gets us roughly to the first quarter, if we have to shut our doors, I'm wondering which of the, the legislators or which of the leaders or the governor is gonna stand next to us and attend to our 26,000 parents across our district. What we really want, and I will reiterate, we are looking for a full comprehensive budget. We are looking for an approved funding formula, and we are asking the state to pay their commitment of our mandated categorical payments. So we're looking for some assistance from our elected officials. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Gill. I am the superintendent of Springfield Public Schools District 186, and I'm uniquely located just a few blocks away from the Capitol. And we serve 15,000 students in Sangamon County and Springfield uh, directly here around the state capitol. I'm uniquely positioned here to see what's going on every day and talk to our local legislators on a regular basis. I'm also here to see that our peers, not only the superintendents behind me, but those in social service agencies and those in our higher education partners suffering day to day from the lack of a budget and also from the lack of equitable and adequate funding across the state of Illinois. Currently, we serve about 67% low-income students and have a high number of students with special needs. And we want to make sure that we are funding our districts at a level that not only adequately supports those students, but equitably does that across the state of Illinois. Although we're very appreciative of the full general state aid this year, the lack of categorical funding to my district is mounting close to $10 million owed. Oftentimes when I'm in conversations about how is the budget affecting you, I say no business would run a budget where they know they're $10 million behind and anticipating that money and operating as if it will come and having that worry that it may not. So once again, our three points today are, please pass a budget for the state of Illinois. Two, make sure we fix the current education funding, that that conversation is going on right now as we speak. And three, make sure that all of our categorical payments come to us in a regular time so that we can budget appropriately for the students in the state of Illinois. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kristen Humphreys. I am the superintendent for the East Moline School District 37 in the Quad Cities. We serve approximately 2,800 students uh, pre-K through 8th grade. Uh, in East Moline, our story is much like you've heard from other superintendents so far. Right now, uh, we have approximately 85% of our students do come from poverty. 25% uh, of our students speak a second language in their home. Uh, we have over 35 languages in East Moline schools. And we have obviously been devastated by proration and the state underfunding our school district. Uh, by, the, by the end of June, we will be owed almost $1.4 million from the state of Illinois. And uh, we've, been, we've been losing approximately $1 million per year from the state of Illinois over the last eight years. I've been superintendent for the East Moline School District seven years. And in that time, we've never had a year where we've received all of our state funding. So we don't know. We're, we're, in East Moline, we're being devastated by cuts like many of the superintendents standing behind us. Uh, and what, what, what we're running into now is we, we cut art, we cut music. We're not cutting those things anymore because there is nothing left to cut. We're cutting reading teachers in East Moline. And it's having a devastating effect on our school district. The state needs to step forward and come up. We have a weighted, integrated formula uh, pre presented in Senate Bill 1, which is something we need desperately in the state of Illinois. We've been here too many years talking about school funding and how we are underfunding our kids. It's time to lift all children up in the state of Illinois. It's time to have a voice for them, and this shouldn't be a partisan issue. Uh, children uh, shouldn't, should never be uh, a Republican or Democrat issue. It should be an issue where we want to have all children and give them the adequate and equitable funding that is needed. The children in my school district have parents that dream about them to have their possibilities. They dream about big dreams for our students, just like students in wealthy communities. And we need the state of Illinois, we need our elected officials to step forward, pass a budget, pay us what they owe, and they need to also pass a new school funding reform like, has been, like that has been presented in Senate Bill 1 for all kids in the state of Illinois. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ralph Grimm, and I'm the superintendent of the Galesburg School District in Galesburg, Illinois, in Western Illinois. Our numbers are much like what you've heard this morning. Uh, we've cut $3.25 million from our operating funds over the last two years. We've raised taxes $2.25 million. We've cut over 60 full-time equivalent positions, and the state owes us a boatload of money. Proration has cost us $8.6 million uh, during the seven years or so that general state aid was prorated. 
And this year on June 30th, the state will owe us $3 million in unpaid mandated categoricals. So our story is very similar to those that you're hearing, and this is happening in school districts across the state. And I want to ask the question, isn't it time for something different to be done? It's time today to get a new funding formula. It's time today to get a budget. It's time to end this nonsense that has robbed our children, 2.1 million children who attend public schools in Illinois, of a high-quality education. If you think about the effect of proration and the lack of payment of the mandated categoricals over time, we have students who will be entering high school next year who know nothing but an underfunded educational system. They do not know what a high quality education system is because for many of us over the last many years, we've done nothing but cut, reduce, eliminate, and destroy good public school system. So I think it's time that we pass a budget, that we get funding reform, and that we address the needs of all 2.1 million students who attend our schools. We cannot afford to lose an entire generation of learners, and that's what's going to happen. In a couple of years, we're going to have sent students through our public school systems that were underfunded. They did not have similar opportunities and they are not as well prepared as we would like them to be. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to get this done today. It's time for all of us to get angry, to get vocal, to get active, and to make this happen. Time is running out for our kids. The time is now. So help us get this done today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jason Henderson, and I'm here representing Triad Community Unit School District, a K-12 district of 3,700 students, 20 minutes east of St. Louis. Uh, Triad, like many other districts, has tried to cut its way to a balanced budget. Um, as state aid was prorated, we cut our staff by 10%, 29 faculty members over a three-year period. But still, we're unable to balance the budget without tapping into our reserves. In 2015, we asked our community members to make a choice. That choice was to cut an additional $1 million or to pass a 50 cent ed fund referendum. Our community stepped up and for the first time in 50 years, Triad passed an education fund referendum in spring of 2015. The new ed fund money brought $2 million to Triad. We hired teachers back, we brought programs back, and all seemed good at the time. So what's the story now? Well, with $2.1 million owed in categoricals, in transportation, and in special education, we're back to where we started. Triad's fin financial situation is just as dire, even with the additional money uh, from, the, from our local revenue. We are unable to meet our budget. What does this mean? It means that we spend time discussing tax anticipation warrants to make our June payroll. It means talking with our board and community about cutting back transportation costs and paying, having students pay to ride every place they go. The time for action is now. Triad can't wait till the next election to receive its money its own. We aren't asking for additional revenue. We're asking for what the state owes, the revenue that we budget for and that we count on to survive. We're asking for our state, state aid and our categoricals to be paid. We know that this is only possible with a full, comprehensive state budget in place. It's bad enough that the state has broken its promises to try it into the other districts up here, but forcing us to break our promises to our community is not acceptable. Leaders in Springfield, pass a budget today that will allow the state to meet its obligations to the districts and, school and students of Illinois. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Gary Kelly. I'm the superintendent of the Ducoin School District located uh, downstate in Southern Illinois. We're a school district of about 1,500 students serving grades uh, K through 12. I, I think back 21 years ago when I became a school superintendent 
and at that time we were talking about school funding. 21 years later, we're still talking about school funding. In our district, during this era of proration, we've lost $3.2 million, uh, which is a significant amount of money in that we've lost 10% of our state aid over that time. During this year, the state owes us over $600,000 in categorical aid, which is still the same as being under proration because it's about 10% of the state contribution that we receive for funding. You know, as I thought about this, and uh, as Ralph mentioned, I wanted to look at this from the perspective of an eighth grade student as well. During the majority of that child's educational experience, we've been under some type of proration, some loss, some situation where education was not fully funded. That student's entering high school now, and we want them to be college and career ready, and we want them to be competitive in a global society. I think about a kindergarten student who's coming into school this year. What is their educational experience going to be for the next 13 years if we cannot come together and develop a formula that works for every student in our state? We have to continue to look at this as a bipartisan effort. This situation did not happen overnight. It's something that has happened over a period of time. We have to look at it from the perspective of us as school leaders. We're doing our job. We're doing everything we can in educating every student that we have in our school districts. On the other hand, there are leaders in this state that operate in this capital that have a solution. We've provided them with a solution to fix the formula. They know the solution that has to take place to develop a state budget. Those two things have to happen in order to have a positive impact on our citizens and in our job, a positive impact on the students that we serve. We implore our leaders to do what has to take place, to change our formula that makes it more adequate for all our children and also at the same time to put together a budget that works for everyone. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Wes Olson. I'm a superintendent at Bond County Unit 2. We are a PK through 12 school district of about 2,000 students located in southwestern Illinois. We serve the communities of Pocahontas, Sorrento, and Greenville. We rely on the state for nearly half our revenues, and since 2011, the state has shortchanged our district nearly $4.5 million, and this includes the over $800,000 in mandated categorical payments that we are owed this year that we were budgeted and had a balanced budget and had planned on receiving those. Like so many other districts you hear about today, we have uh, reduced services such as transportation. Currently, we have kindergartners who ride on a bus for over an hour. We've eliminated counseling and social services to students and families. We've delayed essential repairs in our buildings, including environmental and safety concerns, because we don't have funds to do so. Fortunately, the taxpayers of Bond County passed the county facility-wide sales tax recently and were able to fix some of our roofs so our students aren't wet during the day when they're trying to learn, or they're warm during the cool months, or they're cool during the warm months and they're able to concentrate on learning. In addition, we've uh, delayed purchasing curricular supplies. Most of our textbooks are 10 to 15, 20 years old. Our newest one is a five-year-old math textbook. Uh, we've reduced curricular offerings. We've eliminated staff, including teachers, custodians, cooks, paraprofessionals, and bus drivers. We spent down our cash reserves, so we have about 30 days cash on hand. And we've maxed our local levy continually shifting the burden of funding on the backs of our local property owners. This is not the result of fiscal mismanagement, but the result of the state for years shirking their constitutional responsibility to adequately fund our schools. Two years without a budget is not an example of effective governing. We refuse to accept this as the new normal. We currently have around 39 days cash on hand, as I said, and if there's no FY18 budget, our district will we'll nearly max out our borrowing options to remain open for the 2017-2018 school year. 
The problems of our state did not happen overnight, and the responsibility of those problems does not rest solely um, on this General Assembly or this governor. Nonetheless, it is their responsibility to fix it. It's time to put political rhetoric aside and do the job you were elected to do. The message for our General Assembly and governor, very simple. End the state budget impasse and pass a full budget immediately. Fix the inequitable K-12 funding formula and replace it with an evidence-based model. Invest in education throughout our state, including higher ed, and pay the school district what you owe them this year. Our children, our communities, they deserve better. They deserve action, and they deserve leadership, not empty rhetoric. The time is now to improve the education for our children in Illinois. Thank you. Good morning, my name is John Bartelt. I'm the superintendent of Bloomingdale School District 13 in Northeast DuPage County. Currently, Bloomingdale residents support District 13 by paying taxes that provide roughly 92% of our revenue. Now, how can that happen? Well, it happens when you have a 47-year-old formula that has never been altered or changed over time in order for the state to pick up its share of the burden. It also results in prorations that take place in state payments, and even though we receive 6% from the state, it's enough to cost us 15 staff people or potentially Chromebooks for at least uh, more than half of our students, which use them now solely for uh, curriculum access. We teach our students 21st century learning skills. And when we do this, we teach them that it's the importance of collaboration and working together that helps you find the problems to the, uh, find the solutions to the problems that you have. Unfortunately, I'd like to be able to use our General Assembly and our governor as a great example of how the people that we vote into office are working together for the sake of our students in this state, for the sake of not just the students in Bloomingdale, but for all the superintendents that are standing behind me. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. But today they have an opportunity. They can first pass a budget, a budget that will help support sister agencies to our school district, such as our social service agencies that help our families, as well as our public universities that have, gone, that have been great partners but are struggling right now to make sure their programs are viable. Second, they can fix the formula. The formula is, as, as I said, 47 years old. It's time for making adjustments so that the state picks up its fair share of the funding for all students in the state of Illinois and not rely on local communities to have to fill the gap. And finally, releasing our funds to all of us in the state of Illinois helps us to have to avoid having those difficult conversations with our community to explain to the parents of children why they can't have something when their older children were able to get it. I stand here today representing the group behind me, proudly to ask our general legislature to pass a budget today. You got about 12 hours to get that done. Thank you. Jennifer Garrison, Superintendent of Sandoval 501, about two hours south. In conclusion, I want to point out that we have 440 districts. We are 440 districts strong. We are here today, May 31st. It is the end of regular session. You have one job to do today, legislature, to pass a comprehensive budget. Let's say we have two jobs. And to fix the formula. We are asking for an adequate, equitable formula, not a stopgap budget, a comprehensive budget. If you are listening to this as a, legislat as a legislator, just think of the 1.4 million children we represent. We are looking at you through their eyes. Again, it's May 31st, let's pass the budget. Again, 440 districts represented across the state from Elgin, Chicago, from Eastern Illinois, down to the Southern tip of Illinois. We are here today. Thank you for the press that are available. We will have individual superintendents available for your questions. Thank you.
You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 